And panelists, don't forget to unmute your microphones. Sounds good. Good evening, and thank you for joining us virtually tonight. My name is Sadia Sindhu, and I'm the Executive Director for the UChicago Center for Effective Government, housed here at the Harris School of Public Policy. I'm thrilled to welcome you all this evening for what I know will be a fascinating and wide-ranging discussion of digital and social media dynamics in our nation's politics. We have about an hour and a half scheduled for this evening for a robust panel discussion, followed by 30 to 40 minutes of Q&A. As questions arise, I would like to invite you all to drop the questions into the Q&A section of Zoom at any time during the event, and we'll pass those along to our moderator for the Q&A portion of the event. Before we get started, I wanted to provide you all a quick overview of our work and mission at the UChicago Center for Effective Government. The center was founded in 2019 with an ambitious and important mission to study, debate, and advance reforms that, sketch, that strengthen democratic institutions and improve the capacity of our government to solve public problems. As we all know, these critical issues have only come into sharper relief in the last year and a half. In that time, we've embarked on numerous efforts organized around ideas, education, and engagement that have brought together a wide range of stakeholders, such as tonight, with a vested interest in making government more effective, and those efforts are just beginning. I invite you to keep in touch with CEG by visiting our webpage, signing up to receive our newsletter, and following our work on Twitter. With that, I'm thrilled to turn it over to my colleague, CEG Senior Advisor, Mark Farinella, who will introduce tonight's event. Welcome. Thank you, Sadia. And thank you all for joining what is going to be a great panel discussion tonight. If, if you are interested in politics or interested in the future of uh, uh, political campaigns, uh, particularly online, I think you're in for a really exciting and uh, interesting conversation. Uh, we have with us today some of the nation's top political digital strategists from both sides of the aisle. And uh, in, in fact, moderating the event today is Ben Olson, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Arena, one of the nation's top Republican digital firms. Uh, in, in addition to moderating, I'm hoping Ben will feel free to chime in with his own thoughts during the program, just as the panelists will. Uh, and uh, Ben will introduce the, the panelists in just a moment, but want to mention to you that uh, we'll be messaging out to you the uh, 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 links to the panelists' websites and their biographies so you can learn more about them. We encourage you to take a look and, and uh, uh, get to know a bit more about uh, these panelists. And um, uh, don't forget to send in your questions. We'll do our best to get to as many as we can. We won't uh, necessarily be calling out your name, uh, but we're gonna try and uh, incorporate uh, your questions into uh, the conversation uh, today. And with that, I'll just turn things over to Ben. Ben, would you like to take it away? All right, thank you, Mark. I am excited to be here. I think this will be a really great discussion. Um, as Mark mentioned, all the panelists are working at the highest levels of their respective parties, political industries. And so, you know, with us, uh, let, me, let me introduce our panelists. We have on the Democratic side of the aisle, Kari Chisholm, President of Mandate Media and, and Kari, did I did I pronounce your last name right? Got it. Yep. All right. All right. We also have Annie Levine. She's a partner at Rising Tide Interactive. Hey, Annie. And Patrick McHugh, partner in Gambit Strategies. On the Republican side of the aisle, uh, in addition to myself, we have Carter Kidd. She's the Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at Campaign Solutions. And we also have Shannon Chatlos. She's the Vice President at Strategic Partners and Media. So, you know, Mark mentioned this, but, you, you know, we won't go into the full bio of everyone who's on our panel, but you can learn more about them and see their uh, bios in the links that we're messaging out to you. And, uh, you know, as uh, Sadia mentioned, please feel free to message in your questions at any time. You know, we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. And we've got a a few questions to kick this off right now. We'll start a little bit broad and then we'll drill down. So I'll open this up to our panelists. 2020 is now 
over the election's history, you know, broadly speaking, uh, were voters well served by the internet? I'm just gonna throw it out there, right? <laughs> just gonna throw it out there. Well, I can go ahead and start off unless somebody else wants to. Um, you know, I think if we look back over this past year with COVID-19, I do think the internet played an integral role in our elections and in our entire society. I mean, if you think back, if this, something like this had happened 20 years ago, um, our worlds would have been so different. So many of us were able to shift and be able to continue working. You know, kids figured out how to do school. And for our campaign clients, they shifted to online campaigning. So as a digital campaign firm for us, it, you know, it ended up being great for business. And we still had to be very creative and think about how we're going to get through all the other messages since everyone else is doing the same thing. But I do think the internet made an a positive impact overall. There's a lot of challenges that were out there, but without the internet, it would have been a completely different election cycle. Yeah, I think that's basically right. I mean, you know, not just election cycle, but our, our society itself, you know, digital made this possible. I mean, be able to do conferences like this, meetings, you know, people are able to work. Uh, if you think about just the sort of total isolation that we would have had without digital. That said, you know, in 2020 in particular, I think partly because of the pandemic, but also because of where we are in our political culture, you know, digital also is pretty damaging uh, to the fabric of our republic. I mean, the rise of of conspiracy theories, uh, the QAnon conspiracy in particular, um, you know, I think was partly fueled by the pandemic, but also partly fueled by, you know, sort of the metastasizing of our social media platforms into sort of segmented, segregated uh, filter bubbles that um, didn't allow people to, you know, sort of see the whole world for what it is, and instead spend their time in these little sort of um, back corners of the internet uh, where they were reinforced uh, on what they believed and then fed a steady stream of lies. I don't mean it's just, it's just on the right either, although I think that was the most damaging one this year. There are folks on the left as well who spend their time mired in strange little conspiracy corners of the internet. Yeah, I would add on that um, it also mainstreamed a lot of digital tools that people were kind of slowly onboarding or kind of, especially with, with older voters. So, you know, you saw them adopt more of the, the streaming platforms. Um, we all know how to use QR codes now, um, thanks to the pandemic and menus at restaurants. I can promise you my parents did not know how to do that prior to this. And um, maybe I didn't either, I'm not sure. Um, also, the other thing I would point out is some of the kind of more traditional tactics like teletown halls took off. I mean, so that was something we always had in our toolbox, but I don't know about you guys, but I saw we had way better participation in teletown halls than we had um, in cycles past because it was a way for people to engage. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it helped in a couple of different areas, not just what we would consider, you know, traditional digital. I do think one other piece of internet use that at least looking back, I think some folks missed was the kind of bubble that we existed in as people that could stay at home and work from home. And, um, you know, we were like, wow, everyone's streaming more video, everyone's watching more television. And it almost, um, you know, it needed us we needed to reconsider that when it comes to voter contact, especially the types of voters that we're all fighting to convince on our side, those were the people that are probably less likely to be sitting at home on the internet. They were the ones still going in, uh, working at the grocery stores or in the factory. And so I think one one piece of, that I took away from it was actually not doing an over-reliance on, on internet and sort of the connected television or the high impact expensive buys, but really being mindful of um, what are people looking up on their phones? Are they listening to Pandora um, while they're working? Those are ways to reach people um, where, you know, traditional media folks were still sort of um, thinking, oh, well, people are just at home watching TV. You know, the only thing I would add is that, you know, I, I think that campaigns were well served uh, by the internet. I think for all the reasons you all just laid out, I'm not sure voters were. Um, for the reasons that uh, Kari sort of laid out, um, you know, I think that uh, increasingly people are, um, 
you know, filtering themselves, particularly on social media, into these bubbles where they're only hearing views that are they already hold, and they're, they're reinforcing these views, even if they're they are, you know, rooted in conspiracies. Um, and we're seeing that take hold right now when you see you know vaccination rates among some communities, um, you know, vaccination refusal rates being you know, particularly high. And you know, I'm just not sure that I, I think our all of our campaigns we worked on were able to adapt to that new environment thanks to the internet, thanks to all these tools that we had in our toolbox. Um, that we got to use more than maybe we were expecting to use uh, this election cycle, but. At the end of the day, I'm not sure the voters really gained all that much from that experience. Um, uh, thanks to, frankly, a lot of the organic problems that, that are sort of existing on these platforms. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we should also, I think as political professionals, take a little bit of um, caution. Uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time worrying about the, whether the work that I do, which is to, you know, find um, issues that mobilize, you know, our party's base and use those issues to fire them up, get them angry, give us money. I worry about whether that's actually good for democracy. And, and sort of the, again, in the, in the polarization context, um, a few years ago, I was one of the ones in the room at the University of Chicago saying, polarization, that's overblown, that's okay, people need to choose their corner and we'll go to, you know, we'll fight, that's why we have elections. And now I'm in a world where I wonder if polarization is um, actually a, a, a bad thing for democracy and the, the role that we all play in it. Um, and so that's, I, you know, less of a conclusion and more of a question for myself, I keep asking every day. It's a bad idea for primary, so we know that. I think it goes to a lot of our societal changes that are happening in everyday life. You know, everything has become much more extreme in a lot of things. And the internet in some way has enabled that because kind of what you were just go to your point, Kari, is you can find anybody who might want to be in your corner much more easily than you ever could before. And you have this great platform that is easily accessible. It's often free. And that's just changed the dynamic of how we interact and things that we say that seem okay because it's easy to put it out there when there's no face associated with it. So I agree, we, we look at those things as well. So that's you know, back in the, great... in the in the mid 1990s, let me just tell a story. Back in mid 1990s, uh, right after the 94 Gingrich Revolution, uh, there was talk of Rush Limbaugh running for president. And Rush said one of the smartest things I've ever heard. It's a rare thing. Let me hear me agree with him any other time. Uh, Rush said, "You know, 10% uh, market share in talk radio makes you the king of talk radio, but it makes you a laughing stock in politics, uh, where of course we need 50% plus one to win an election." And what I worry is that we've all become sort of people who live on a 10% market share. That's how you raise money, is to build that 10% market share of people who really, really love you. Um, and it's, you know, that's, that's, that's a piece of, you know, again, as I said, uh, worrying me. Nice. I think it's very obvious that the internet is a great source of information. Um, I saw a funny meme about a week ago that said, if you took Abraham Lincoln and dropped him into today's society and you showed him this little, device that had access to all pieces of information um, ever. And he, and he said, well, you know, everybody must be a genius then everybody. And, and the response was, no, everyone just uses it to troll each other and uh, look at cat photos. Uh, so that being said, the, the internet is obviously a wonderful source for information there are some negative aspects of it, the polarization piece, but also some of the false information that circulates on it. The, you know, the next question, and, and I'll just kind of go here in reverse order. So, so Patrick, I'll kick this off to you. Who bears responsibility for some of the adverse effects of the digital, particularly some of the ad networks and some of the social media networks? Is this something when it comes to politics that, campaigns are responsible for their staff or you know do we need a third-party watchdog or is it the networks themselves yeah in my opinion it should be the networks themselves i mean they um are sort of particularly the social media networks like facebook um you know not only allowing um you know polarization to to run rampant in this fake fake information to run rampant on their platform they're, they're making money from it i mean they're making conscious decisions every single day um, to have their algorithm uh, favor uh, information that is inflammatory and that will drive further polarization and often includes uh, information that isn't true. Uh, and so ultimately, I think that you know, they're responsible for the content that is being uh, 
being served to people on their platforms. And I, and I think that, um, you know, a lot of focus is around uh, the content and advertising. But I think to me, the most troubling thing, um, the things that, you know, I think the, the platforms need to figure out how to solve is on the organic side of things, uh, where really you see um, that is where misinformation uh, really flourishes. Um, and not as much on the sort of advertising side of things, uh, where candidates and campaigns, right, are held to account for the information that they are putting money behind, uh, you know, more so than, you know, uh, a random citizen who is just spreading uh, false information about uh, whatever they might uh, not agree with that day. Yeah. Shannon, um, how about you? What do you think bears responsibility? I think we all do. I mean, I think I, 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 um, I think it's everybody's responsibility to, you know, to be honest and speak, speak the truth. I think the challenge is that that you've got a lot of different truths that people feel. Um, I think that I, I, I commend Facebook for trying to, you know, they created that that third party group, their Supreme Court, if you will. Um, I think that's what people are kind of calling it to try to, you know, weigh in and, and, and develop a ruling. But when it came down to it, the folks on that panel basically said, no, we don't want to have it on our shoulders. We want Facebook to have to make that decision themselves. So, I mean, this is, if you place a television ad and then you have false information in the television ad, the television ad gets taken down and lawyers get involved. Um, we just don't have as much transparency on you know, the digital side right now. Um, and there's just a lot of platforms. I mean, we, as you guys all know, it's very hard for us to see, you know, if, if a Republican campaign is running a certain digital ad campaign, it's hard for our opponent to see what we're running um, out there. It's not as, it's not, you know, on the everyday broadcast waves. So this is not gonna be solved anytime soon, I don't think. Um, what do you guys think? I mean, I just think it's, but I think everybody bears responsibility. I do think as political practitioners and, and leaders in our industry, we should set an example. And, and we do have a code of ethics. We all are members of different organizations that have a code of ethics and it's up to us to kind of lead there. Um, but, you know, I agree with um, Patrick that a lot of it's happening from the organic side, not necessarily the paid side. And I think Facebook's a rare network that uh, has unified Democrats and Republicans in our frustration of them. Um, you know, there are other ad networks. They don't talk about it. You know, Hulu does ads reviews. They submit it. A real human looks at it and they say whether or not this is something that they feel is OK to run on their network. Facebook doesn't want to take on that responsibility. And, um, you know, ahead of Georgia, special election really just wasn't being an honest broker. They said, we can't um, just run ads in one state. That's not functionally possible. And, um, you know, we knew from the beginning you actually can because we've done that targeting in all the states we've worked on. And then they reversed course because, you know, people applied rightfully so pressure. Um, but that impacted uh, candidates' ability to raise money. It impacted on both sides. It impacted candidates' ability to communicate with voters and they did it just because they didn't want to deal with it. Um, so it's not just, you know, what is going on in the network. It's just functionally, they're not really inspiring um, brand loyalty uh, with uh, digital advertisers, I would say. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much subjectivity. You do need a human looking at it at the end of the day. And that's not perfect, but I agree with what you're saying, Annie. I mean, it wasn't working to not have human involvement at some level. And it's incumbent upon all of us. And, and I think the biggest challenge that we saw and we've continued to see on platforms beyond just advertising, you know, email platforms and things, it's subjective. You know, what one person is saying, no, I'm just, you know, impassioned about something somebody else feels is going too far. And, you know, where is the line? Certainly there is the code of ethics and I think a lot of us follow it, but there's still even gray areas beyond that. You know, what is specifically saying it's too much versus not. I'm, I'm just gonna echo what Patrick was saying about the algorithms. You know, I, I have some sympathy for Facebook in, in where, they, where they started in all this, which is to say, look, if you're building a social network and you want people to look at your stuff and, 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 and pay attention all day long, uh, which is gonna be how you're gonna make some money, you're 
try and figure out what content is the most interesting to people, the most exciting, um, the one that's getting all the, the likes and the clicks, well, then you're going to share that with people. It seems like a fairly content neutral, kind of obvious solution to the question of, well, what's interesting? Share that. Uh, and yet, now we're in a position where the stuff that is the most interesting and the most sticky, uh, the most engaging is the stuff that's false. Uh, and so I don't blame Facebook for not having seen it ahead of time. I blame them now, having been forewarned, having experienced that we've all seen it, uh, that they are not then finding a way to resolve it. And you know, and again, in the resolving it, there's some sympathy there. They simply don't have enough humans to read everything that everybody posts, but they have enough humans to read everything that gets, I'll call it, a hundred thousand shares at a time. Like that's enough. That's a small enough sample that they could they could filter. They could slow down the engagement train if something's suddenly taking off. Maybe something funny somebody just said on a live TV show. That's great. You know, everybody should share that. Or maybe it's a wild conspiracy theory that has that is dangerous and, and they should put the brakes on, have a human reviewer. Uh, it's time for them to, to get their act together. That's great. It's a very complex argument, but I think for the most part, people agree that, you know, what different campaigns and political operatives are dealing with right now would be um, one of two things. And it kind of sometimes falls along party lines, but it transcends both. And that is, is censorship a bigger problem and over censorship or not enough censorship versus, you know, too, too many things being allowed. Uh, they're not being enough controls. And so I would just you know, ask the panel, you know, everyone jump in. Do you see one of those issues being more problematic than the other? Again, you know, censorship versus an, an over allowance of, of content. I mean, I think, oh, go ahead, Amy. No, no, go ahead, Jenna. <laughs> I was just going to say that if, if, if the censorship problem to me becomes a problem for for the stability of the platform itself because if if people feel that they're over censored they're going to go somewhere else so it's just we're going to be chasing you know chasing an audience at that point so you know i i don't think people will stay on platforms that are over over censored I just thought it was, you know, sort of ironic where, you know, the Trump campaign and, and President Trump were complaining about censorship where it's like, you, you know, he had the biggest microphone and the biggest platform in the world. You know, you can use your um, press briefing room to have that conversation with America. Um, you know, you, you sign a terms of service and agreement when you decide to use these platforms. Um, you're not, I, I think, essentially born with a God-given right to be able to post on Facebook, essentially. Um, so I think you need to, to play by some sort of rules, um, or else, you know, there, there are unintended or, or intended consequences. I think we, we saw a little bit of that in January. Yeah. I mean, I think if, you know, obviously Facebook has the right to take people off their platform. We don't follow their rules. I, I would say as a general principle, if I was, if I was Facebook, uh, I would say, well, we're going to allow everyone to be here and we're going to give people the freedom to, to say whatever they want to say. But there's no right, there's right to free speech. There's not a right to be amplified. And that to me is the key, the key difference here is that sure, post all you want, but if you post something that is harmful, dangerous, false, whatever, whatever the rules are, we're just not going to, you know, you're, you're, you'll still have your, your post. It's just not going to get amplified out to, to, to a broader public. Um, stuff that's really engaging, that is, legitimate and fair and uh, upstanding, great. Let it, you know, spread like wildfire. Stuff that's dangerous and, and false ought to slow down. I think dangerous is the most important key there, right? I mean, there's been a lot of dangerous, very dangerous rhetoric, and that's what has to stop. And I totally think that should be stopped by the platforms themselves, if possible. Yeah, we, I mean, we saw it on email systems as well, you know, going beyond just Facebook. And I think that's where certainly some of our clients kind of came in to have some challenges because that's where it's even more gray. It was not, you know, absolutely. It's very clear if you're inciting violence, but if you are, in, you know, the days after the election questioning if things are valid or not when it's unknown, that, you know, is more of a, 
that was they were feeling that they were starting to be censored once we knew and once you know Biden is sworn in and things like that there there's more understanding to curb some of that but I think that it was a challenge for our clients to deal with and that's going beyond Facebook because I agree exactly with what you're saying Kari with amplification but it's a little different if you have an email list and can send it out you can still spread your message very quickly yeah at least at that point though it's got a I mean, you know, in the early days of the internet, we all we all had you know relatives and friends who had passed along chain letters right. and false conspiracy theories. <laughs> but you know, the 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 viral spread of that um, is so much less, right, than, than what can happen on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Uh, you know, it, it's just it's so much less when you're, you know, everybody's just emailing a, a few dozen friends their you know, whatever their crazy you know, conspiracy theories. Patrick, what about you? Any thoughts on the censorship issue? Yeah, to me, I, I think it's sort of a false choice. I'm not sure that I would uh, I would ca characterize what they're doing as, as censorship. I mean, I, I think at the, at the end of the day, um, they also view there's they have some responsibility for the things that are posted on their platform, and if they're dangerous to people, um, that uh, they're going to take them down. It's not just in the political space, right? If somebody threaten some physical violence to another person on, on you know, Facebook, or somebody flags that post, uh, they'll take it down and uh, they'll, they'll be alerted to that. Um, and so I, I sort of, you know, uh, I hear what y'all are saying in terms of sort of your inability to get the message out to voters through email systems. But, you know, at the end of the day, you choose to use that email provider, you can go to another one. And I think that, um, you know, the uh, all of these providers and platforms, you know, you sign up terms um, of service, and if you violate them, they, they can no longer provide you service. I mean, it's a pretty simple transaction in the marketplace, um, so I don't really view it as censorship. Um, I view it as a necessity almost. I think that's where we saw kind of a change this year was because I completely agree with what you're saying, Patrick. I mean, like terms of service are laid out. I think what we experience with a lot of email systems is they're like, well, yeah, it says it's okay in our terms of service, but we don't really like what you're saying. And that's where it was becoming a friction point of like, okay, well, if it follows it, then how do we do it? But you're right. And the solution is you go somewhere else. So the thing there is, is you have choices, right? There's a lot of email. Exactly. Providers. There's only, only one, one Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> There's only one Twitter, right? And so that, that becomes the, the, the tension uh, there, for sure. So I, I do want to take a question from the audience. And I totally recognize that this question might be a little bit controversial, but we want to have a little sense of giving the people what they want. So if anybody wants a pass on answering this question, no problem at all. Um, so it's a two part question. The first is, is Facebook's Supreme Court enough of a way to create some kind of objectivity with the issue of post reviews? And secondly, should former President Donald Trump stay banned from all social platforms or, or do you view this as an infringement on free speech? So Kari, we'll just go reverse order. What do you think? You know, uh, I am fascinated by the Facebook Oversight Board, the Supreme Court. Um, it is, uh, it's worth reading the bios of every single person on it. Uh, they are a diverse group. Uh, they speak dozens of languages. They're from all over the world, uh, come from an extraordinary range of, of backgrounds, former prime ministers, former federal, U.S. federal judges. Um, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a fascinating group. Um, so to the extent that Facebook's responsible for setting up a sort of independent outside body, uh, I think they've done a good job of picking the body. Now, the, the challenge is, is, is what role do they play? Um, you know, as Shannon alluded to a few minutes ago, they kind of kicked back a question to Facebook on, on Donald Trump. Uh, we're not going to decide, you decide. Um, when some of their earlier decisions had laid down fairly clear principles that they expected Facebook to, to follow. Um, you know, is it a good body? You know, yeah, I, I think it's a useful thing for Facebook to sort of have an outside group that is, that has, you know, you know limited terms, they're paid, whether they, you know, uh, whether Facebook likes what they do or not. That's, I think, a useful structure for corporate governance. Should there be outside rules that are actually like federal laws and stuff? Yes, of course. Um, but in the absence of, of government regulation, you know, this is an attempt by Facebook to create some kind of a layer. 
as for Donald Trump, um, look, he, he, neither he nor anyone else has an absolute right to, you know, a, a business, to use a Facebook account, right? You don't have an absolute right to go to the mall either. Um, and so, I, you know, Facebook wants to ban him. You know, great, go for it. Um, that's within their rights. Uh, should they ban him? Um, I, I think as long as he's continuing to promulgate the big lie that, that he won the election, that he's some sort of like, you know, power in exile, ready to seize control as soon as the, you know, the, the, the you know, he can get it. Yeah, absolutely. He should, he should be, you know, banished from polite society, much less social media platforms. Absolutely. My beef with the, the Facebook oversight board is I don't actually think anyone there is a digital advertising practitioner. Um, and I think everyone on this panel knows what a pain in the butt it is to even get approved to run ads. And even then it is half of a nightmare just to get them live. And you have an oversight board that functionally doesn't understand the product. And um, that that's great that you have really amazing bios and great experience, but a board functionally should be something that offers, you know, expertise. Um, and again, you know, I think the recommendations, the conversations, they're not really getting to the root of some of the, the issues that we're discussing today because they have no real life experience with what they're trying to suss through. Um, so in that way, I, I don't know how effective they've, they've been or I certainly, you know, haven't really seen much happening over there. Um, I, I'll just, you know, double click on, on Kari's opinion on Trump. I certainly feel a lot more calm these days not having to see um, those tweets and Facebooks and I didn't even follow him on Twitter. It was just in my feed and it was something that I wasn't asking for, but because of the way that these social media um, platforms work, um, it was there. And so, you know, if you aren't going to abide by the rules of the road, then you don't, you don't need to be on it <laughs> is sort of my opinion here. You're right about the, the lack of advertising experience or even the lack of sort of political experience um, or digital politics experience uh, on the on the board they haven't addressed any advertising questions i don't believe yet but uh that'll come and you're right they're gonna need some some folks with some expertise i'm not sure anybody on the facebook side of the political advertising uh a transaction has used their platform for political advertising uh they, they they're not they're not you know they're not eating their own dog food, as they say in silicon valley shannon or patrick any any thoughts on the Facebook Supreme Court and uh, is is President Trump's banning infringement on free speech or the appropriate thing to do? Um, Facebook Supreme Court, I think it um, is a step in the right direction. I could not agree with Annie more. They don't, I mean, it's not, it, it, it can deal with some big umbrella issues. And I think they've come down with three and a half decisions um, since they were started. So, um, but I do, you know, at least it's something, right? And at least it's people that are qualified and as far as an intellectual diversity um, standpoint. I don't know what to do about Trump. Um, I have, I have, I don't know if we put him on some sort of probation and every single thing he says has to be screened before it's released or, you know, I, I but, I, I do think that it caused um, so much collateral damage for so many other candidates and races that that has to be in consideration that because of one person's behavior, the collateral damage on the electoral process was tremendous. Um, so that's something to be considered. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's an important distinction that he's actually not banned from all social media platforms, just the ones that he wants to use. Uh, that, uh, you know, he has his own website, which he calls a platform, which is a blog, and, and he posts his opinions on there. And people, if they care to think, if they care about what Donald Trump thinks, can go on there and read them at their own free will. Um, and so that, I think that's an important distinction. I think, Annie, to your earlier point about the, uh, the board reminds me of, frankly, some of the Senate oversight hearings. Uh, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg sat there yeah. and it's very clear that many of these senators, many of whom are in the party that I fight very hard uh, to elect uh, people to Congress from uh, have never been on Facebook in their entire lives. And they're sort of wholly uh, unequipped to be able to uh, you know, provide oversight and propose, frankly, any regulations on the, on the platforms that they've never uh, used in their life. And so I think that 
you know, it, it is a problem not just uh, for the oversight board, but frankly, we need more people in elected office who have sort of come of age uh, with the internet and understand the unique challenges that uh, are facing our society um, as we move more and more online. You know, I think that's a very important note that Annie brought up about the difficulty that she experiences with on getting things live. Um, I think there's a misperception in the public that the ad networks are more helpful to one party or the other. And, you know, in, in an effort of bipartisanship here on this call, I think a lot of us have dealt with very similar problems with how, how hard it is to actually get content through and get content um, live. I mean, you know, again, a little bit putting people on the spot and you can take a pass, but in terms of getting things live on, on Facebook and the other networks, on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is very easy and smooth and you just post, post some ads and they become live and one being extremely arduous, I think I would say we're at about a four right now you know, where it's really, really hard. Um, and we are constantly trying to navigate their process. But, you know, um, how would all how would you all rate that? That was pretty generous got, rating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I know I've got, you know, my ad team would actually probably give it a one or a two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I was gonna say, I think sometimes, you know, they change their policies so frequently throughout the electoral process. So if you and we've, I think we all talked about this on another panel, but, you know, one thing that was so frustrating was as soon as we all figured it out, and we became our client advocate, we were able to get our clients you know, approved on the platform, they'd change the rules again. But what if you didn't have a consultant by your side? It, what about exactly. the regular candidate who just needs to run, you know, for county council or for mayor or for dog catcher? I mean, how are those people, they can afford consultants that, you know, can, can navigate these very challenging platforms. So it's a real disservice to, you know, the electoral process, I think, for the regular citizen candidate. I completely agree. And we've had those exact discussions. Like we're, for people who've worked on these platforms, who know how to advocate, who know how to call somebody to get it. And we still have such a difficult time. And again, the rules always are changed every time we think we can do it. And, and I think it, it frustrates us even more because it looks like we don't know what we're doing when we go to our clients. Like, okay, this is what you need to do. Oh, sorry. No, Facebook changed the rules again. So I, I think it is a challenge. And I do think it impacts down ballot races who want to be able to run it, which is kind of the whole point of what Facebook has wanted to do with a lot of their political tools is to make it easy and accessible, which is a great thing. And I think that's really important. People are on the platform, help those candidates use that platform, but it's become so difficult. And they just didn't ever, I think, didn't actually talk to normal people that needed to use it. Yeah, I mean, a good example of this in real life, you know, the Priorities USA last cycle, we were able to, Facebook wouldn't run a, a number of our ads. We were able to, to push them to approve them because we threw a lot of political weight around as one of the largest super PACs in the party, made a big public fuss about it, and still took several days to get them to a place where they would approve our ads. But any organization or candidate uh, that doesn't have those sort of relationships can, you know, call uh, you know, call representatives very high up at, at Facebook and push on uh, elected officials to also push them to, to do the right thing. Um, they're not going to have, right, that opportunity. Um, and e even just seeing on the other side publicly, the Biden campaign themselves were having a problem getting all of their ads approved. Um, uh, and so uh, if, a, if a major, you know, presidential campaign uh, in the final weeks of an election is having a problem, uh, down ballot candidates certainly are just in a, in a place where you they're not going to be able to, to reach the voters they need to reach. Patrick, are you talking about the difficulty of getting things approved because there's a, a judgment happening about the political content? Uh, they may not want to approve it because of the content. Or are you just talking about the challenge of getting it like through the pipeline, someone to look at it and check the box that it's okay? Yeah, the technical part of it. Right. It was the issue where they wanted all ads uploaded by a certain time in the final weeks to be able to run because they wanted to be able to run reviews in time. And as a result, a lot of people uploaded a lot of ads to meet that deadline. 
right? Versions of ads that would run later towards the election. So vote tomorrow, for example, you would upload that weeks ahead of time to get it through the approval process, right? And that entire, the, the process that they laid out for us wasn't actually the process they followed, right? And so that I think is the, the bigger problem. Like I would be fine with an arduous process. I'd be fine if it was a four. The problem is they change it between a one and a four and a five and a six every day. And you just never know um, when they're going to make these arbitrary changes, which of course is, is the right as a platform, but I think that is the, one of the key frustrations is the constant change. And even the platform they set out and the platform that they built, like you're the one of the biggest guys in this space, and you're building a non-functional platform, right? You had months to prepare for this, and then you tell us, I, I don't think we actually were able to say vote tomorrow, right? We couldn't say vote today or something along those lines, but some ads came through with um, language that weren't actually supposed to be approved. And I don't think it was like malicious after saying we want Donald Trump to say it and not Democrats. I think it was just like bad machine work. And so how, how can you even prepare for something um, as that as Facebook and not have it ready to go? No way to run a lemonade stand, much less a billion dollar a month business. It's just amazing. I think it's interesting well, if you look at all the backlash with like schools and virtual schools and like how schools not have been able to prepare to open and things like that you know you look at it in comparison to Facebook similar like you had all this time and it didn't work and I think the schools are a much different situation and Facebook had all the developers and engineers they could have used. So I think we all agree the networks especially Facebook and Google are struggling with how to figure this out, how to execute it, how to monitor it. And, you know, let's shift the conversation to bans of ads on platforms. You know, we are into the cycle of 2022 and we now have political advertising banned on Twitter, on uh, Snapchat, on Spotify. Um, it's now gone and trickled down into certain DSPs and you know for audience members that don't know what a DSP is it's a demand side platform which is a way to buy online ads um, across the whole internet and you know that ban has started with some DSPs with Adobe more one of the prominent ones um, you know for me personally I feel like that is a big violation of the First Amendment and of speech. And one of the things I think separates America out from the rest of the world is our campaign process. For all the benefits it has and all the negatives that it has and you know some of the ill effects of it, it is a democratizing setup where people don't have to be an incumbent. People don't have to be... Um, independently famous or wealthy in order to run for office and succeed in office. There's lots of stories of people who, you know, where some of the networks are basing their, their policies on an ad ban off of things in other countries. And, you know, if we have a distribution medium like direct mail or television, you should be allowed to run and have political messaging into it. That is a right protected by the First Amendment. And it, for me personally, it scares me and freaks me out to see groups banning the political ad speech. Um, so the question, everybody, and I'm going to put this in the chat as well because um, it's a multi-part question. Um, so that's in everyone's chat. So you know, several platforms that ban political advertising altogether. And even the largest platforms, Facebook and Google instituted temporary bans. You know, ultimately they were lifted, but we had temporary bans after the general election. So the question is, what are they trying to achieve? What are the pros and cons of this? And do you see this as a potential end to a ban of political digital advertising on the web? I mean, is this something that could extend to the big networks. It seems like they're spending a lot of time, resources, and political capital dealing with this. Do we have a potential ban coming? And uh, what can political campaigns do to adjust to these bans? So again, multi-part, so it's in the chat. I think a lot has to do with 
impending regulation. I think a lot of these ad networks go, you know what, forget it. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to be in the fray. I just want to step back. I agree with what you're saying. It concerns me from a first amendment issue, from a democracy issue. Like we need to be able to communicate messages. And I think with a lot of, you know, just the hearings about Facebook, when there was all the data issues, a lot of companies went, you know what, easier just to bow out and not deal with it. And I think that is a sad, sad state. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's lazy. Uh, I mean, a lot of this started the 20, what happened in 2016, right? Where you had Russian operatives uh, paying for ads in rubles on Facebook uh, designed to, to talk to American voters. Uh, on top of all the organic stuff that was happening there, it all starts, you know, there. And and you, what you had was a few folks like Facebook try and figure out a way to authenticate people. Remember, we all got postcards in the mail to confirm that we were a legitimate American, you know, in the United States to buy our ads and all that. Um, and I can, you know, there are others who just said, you know, this is this is too complicated, so we're going to ban political advertising because we don't want to deal with uh, figure out how to, how to authenticate folks. Now we should sit into a space where we're talking a lot about the content of the ads and, you know, are, are folks using uh, paid advertising to drive violence or conspiracy theory nonsense? That's mostly not true. Uh, that all that action is mostly on the organic side, um, as Patrick was saying earlier. Um, frankly, I think one of the challenges is, is, as I think Shannon was alluding to earlier, all this, regulation and this restrictions make it a lot harder for the for the dog catcher to run for office um and also by the way as a person who also owns a, a non-political small business with my, my spouse it's almost impossible to run ads uh as a non-political small business and um uh, all the various you know rules and all that but to get to the question of again of, of, of banning political advertising I, in a ban on the one hand i think well, gee, they're a private business. They can do whatever they want, right? I mean, that's stuff to free market. On the other hand, if they're going to provide a service to the public, which is to say we run ads, and if you're the local, you know, uh, dentist down the street or your Pepsi-Cola, you can buy ads and then just say, eh, but if you work for office, you're out. That does, you're right. That does seem to be anti-democratic. But to piggyback on that, the po what's political is very broad. So what if, you know, you're talking about creating jobs in your community, if you're talking about, you know, a climate crisis, if you're talking about all these things fall under transportation, you know, and now we're, you know, all these businesses have an opportunity to participate in infrastructure and the, you know, so all of this, just so all our attendees know, like all that actually falls under political. So it's not just candidate ads it's also advocacy and community organizing so um you know it's it's not just political and that's where i think we really get into a dangerous zone yeah you know, the, the climate activists will say exxon is out there running ads on twitter saying we're doing our best to solve the climate crisis meanwhile the sierra club can't run an ad saying exxon is the cause of the climate crisis uh you know there's a, there's a little bit of a of a, of a uh, unfairness there And, I, and look, I mean, I think at the, at the end of the day, is my opinion not backed up by any fact. I, I would imagine that Facebook probably would have kept the ban if Democrats didn't control Congress. If by and large, Democrats raise more money on Facebook than Republicans do. We rely more on small dollar donors and we, uh, we foster those donors. And one of the premium platforms that we do so is on Facebook. And I, I have a hunch that if those power dynamics were not at play, they might have kept uh, the ban in place. If they weren't getting a lot of pressure from Democrats who hold power now in Washington to reverse it. Um, and uh, to me, you know, that's a, it's a very troubling uh, trend. And I think even more troubling that the advertisements aren't the problem. Like I said before, it's the organic, um, oftentimes content that is the most problematic and not the, the ads themselves. And I do think that it's an important distinction, which is for the vast majority of the Facebook spend that we do for clients is for fundraising. It's for raising money. It's for acquiring new email addresses. As a you know mobilization and persuasion platform, there are better options out there. And so one of the ways that we're really adjusting on um, both in 2020 because we had to because the ads were shut down, um, but you know moving forward. We have the records of the amount of spend that we spent on Facebook cycle over cycle over cycle, and it's shrinking. You know, if you really want to get 
an impactful 30 second ad across to a viewer, Facebook is not the platform to do it because most people have the sound off and they're scrolling down to see like your new um, baby photo from your best friend. And so what we're doing, at least as a company, is really uh, preparing for the um, post Facebook world and finding other viable options for serving ads that we know are effective. Like you don't need an emoji to make your ad work. You need um, compelling, authentic content and a good targeting strategy. And I think that's at times what makes it even more in concerning that all these other platforms are bowing out. Cause I totally agree. You know, we want other ways to communicate messages and things like that. And if no one wants to run these ads, that's hard. It's hard to support our candidates and get them elected and then promote all the issues we need to talk about. I can see that one of our viewers took a uh, great exception to what I said about uh, free speech. And one thing that I want to clarify is that yes, these are private companies and private companies do have a lot of leeway as to what they can and can't do and say. I think where, from my point of view, there's conflict here is that at what point do they stop being a private company versus a distribution channel versus a means that's ingrained into our lives that we use that everybody uses on a day-to-day -day basis and is like television is like your mailbox and so that's what i meant by um the first amendment and, and protected free speech yeah private company can allow what they want, but when it's not a private company and it's a utility, when it's a network, well, then it does need to be. And then there's debate as to what, um, to what these groups are. Um, so if anyone wants to dive into that more, I can also tie it into another question that we have from the audience that is given the problems and critiques that these networks face and the revenue that they receive on the other, from their point of view, are they wise or foolish to just get rid of political advertising? Well, Ben, so Facebook is a public company. If I mean, if we want to, so, so, and they have shareholders and they can be That's punished nice. by their shareholders. So to not, not defending you there, but um, you know, if, 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 if Facebook makes a mistake, they're going to have they are going to have repercussions in the marketplace. Um, and if they stop advertising on political, then again, they're going to have to define that because right now they're defining it very broadly um, and they're going to lose revenue and they are a public company. So they're, you know, if they choose to do that, I think they're going to take a hit. Yeah, ben, I think you, you raised an interesting question a bit ago, you know, to me the best I mean, the, the, the broadcast networks are a good analogy, but so are like power companies, private power companies uh, that are so um, integral to people's lives. We, we regulate them as public utilities. You know, you can't just shut off somebody's power. Uh, you don't feel like serving them anymore. Um, and there's an interesting question there. I mean, the, 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 the audience attendee who's asking the question about what, what's free speech got to do with private companies? Well, except that if they're going to offer a service to everyone, uh, every business, everybody can advertise, oh, except for this one class of advertisers, which happens to be the most important for our democracy, which is you know political campaigns and political advocacy organizations. Um, there ought to be some questions about public utility regulation. Now, I will. I want to. I want to make sure you hang a lantern on that for a second. What we have here is a bipartisan group. Uh, uh, of Republicans and Democrats. And even the Republicans are talking about uh, regulating corporate behavior, uh, which I think maybe might, might have been a little bit surprising a few years ago uh, to see, uh, see, see you all talking about regulating private behavior. I think it's a, I think it's a fascinating um, commentary on where we have come in, uh, in our politics today. That's great. Um, Patrick, Carter, Annie, any, anything you want to uh, weigh in there on? I mean, I think it's foolish for them to be in advertising again. Like I said before, I don't think advertising is a problem. I recognize that, you know, 
they're probably not making that much money relative to the other parts of their business on political advertising. So I, I could yeah. see in their head how banning it would solve some um, uh, discomfort um, politically uh, in the short term, but that's also banning it also causes them discomfort. And like I said before, the reason why I think Facebook turned it back on is because of the pressure they were receiving by those in power in Washington. I think that um, the reason why I think that moving back and forth between bans is, is foolish is because you're not actually solving the real problem. And you know, by constantly changing your mind, you're actually putting yourselves <laughs> directly in the crosshairs of regulators um, uh, as opposed to having some consistency in your beliefs. Uh, no, I agree with that. And I think that's where I found the frustration with some of the other ad networks deciding to ban ads because it's not the organic content that is often driven and, you know, is being played into by algorithms, you know, is it often a specific buy, you know, who you're targeting and you're, you know, sharing a political message. And I don't think, you know, just lumping that in with organic Facebook posts makes sense. Like they're different things, they need to be handled differently. And but, uh, you know, I get it from some of the company's points of view. It's just not worth the fight. It's easier to bow out. And um, I think that's too bad. And that's an issue that I think we have to work through. All right. So we've focused a lot about the advertising piece, Facebook, Google, a lot of the ad networks. You know, the internet and digital is obviously a lot more encompassing. There's websites, apps, um, social, organic social, there's now um, uh, a trend of messenger apps being used for wider distribution of, of discourse. So, you know, my question for all the panelists would be, where are we headed in terms of online politics? You know, with 2022 and another presidential in just a few short years of 2024, where are we going? What are we going to see more of? What will we see less of? In a weird way, the pandemic was sort of a, a time for us to shine uh, as digital practitioners because people started to acknowledge that um, it's not just you know a tactic to money grab um, in terms of raising money uh, through email or ads, but actually every part of modern campaigning is touched by um, you know the digital infrastructure. Um, and I think that that's going to continue to grow. Um, you know, you you touched on apps and and I think that it's sort of um as like I I hear worries from the candidates that I work with about um WhatsApp you know that's something that is completely insulated within um you know communities or families talking and they're spreading misinformation within within themselves and you know culturally I think that over indexes with you know potentially Hispanic voters which is something that I think we all have our, our, our eye on is where those voters are going to go in 2022 and so I, I think it just becomes bigger and people know that there's more stuff to worry about right it used to be what is what is someone saying on television how am I replying back to it and now candidates and um, anyone who is a savvy campaigner knows there, you just need to be on top of everything. And so the digital campaign just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. From our side, uh, we didn't have as much use of apps, I would say. I mean, I think email is still plays a critical role in what we're doing on the Republican side. Some of it's our donor base and things like that, but that's still, there's been a concerted effort for several years to really build email lists. I don't think that's going away. Still works very, very well. And, um, you know, I don't know for the apps, it'll be interesting, but again, on our side, it hasn't been as much of a focus though to go to what Annie's saying. I think the growing challenge is just, there are more and more outlets that you need to keep track of and see what's being said and how can you respond. And to a degree, it's impossible to respond to everything, but how much can you at least keep on top of is really important to see and how you are going to react or not. I think I'll be watching uh, for, and I don't, I don't know if it's the future of our politics, but you know, we've all just spent now about a year and a half learning how to Zoom. Uh, <laughs> we learned how to be remote. Um, it, you know, I, 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 I will never again fly across the country for a one hour meeting. Uh, we've all learned how to do this, right? And, and um, a lot of our of our clients, our candidates learned how to do high dollar fundraising um, through these digital platforms. Now, 
you know, I'm not sanguine about it. Obviously, people want to have events again. Obviously, high dollar donors are going to have FaceTime. They want to press the flesh. They want to see you in person. Uh, so a lot of those things will come back uh, as this pandemic recedes. But we will have all learned how to use these tools. And so I think there'll be an interesting question about, you know, what about small dollar grassroots national Zoom fundraisers, Zoom events? Right now, we're all Zoomed out. We're all burned out of Zoom, although apparently not for the whatever it is, 170 people who are here watching us. But um, once we all get back to real life, and then winter comes, uh, I won't be at all surprised if people start to use this tactic uh, to, to communicate in ways that wouldn't have been foreseen before the pandemic. I just like, I continue to push back on that idea that we're all Zoomers for the rest of our life. Um, I mean, I certainly am ready to get on out of there. But um, besides that, when it comes to people that maybe have just $5 to give to a candidate or people that are persuadable voters, they don't have access to broadband. That's something that we'd like to change. Uh, they don't have high-speed internet. They don't have time to sit on a computer for 30 or an hour to talk to or hear from a candidate. Um, so I, I really do think that there's some stuff that because of our point of privilege and because we work on the internet and it's in a national, it's a natural connection to assume um, we'll all be digital people for the rest of time. I do think that there will always be an in-person or traditional element of campaigns because you just lose a huge part of a really, you know, important part of the electorate. I totally I agree. There'll always be the in-person. I think it, though the Zoom events get kind of a middle group that we might not have had otherwise. You know, the people who do work on the internet who are busy and have different lives, they might be kind of just this other group that wouldn't have gone to an event that aren't a high dollar person and you can take advantage of it because I agree, like they're in the $5 donors where you get to see a big rally and feel that energy, that'll come back. But how do we expand and go after those people who aren't gonna attend a rally, but still wanna give 20 bucks, maybe something like that. Folks who wanna listen to a Princess Bride, you know, table read and chip in 10 <laughs> bucks to the Wisconsin Democrats or whatever it is. And those, 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 those events are coming back. To me, I think two things. One, on the organic side, and this might be a pine sky crazy idea, but maybe people will be a little nicer to each other. I think it's a, and maybe be a little less polarized. I think it's really easy to uh, tweet or post on Facebook some really inflammatory stuff, knowing that you're never going to see the people who you're arguing with in real life. And then when you see them in real life, you're, you would never say some of the things that people say. Uh, and so as things, people start interacting more in person. Uh, uh, that hopefully uh, the temperature will get taken down a little bit. Uh, and number two, I think on the advertising front, I think the biggest changes uh, that are going to happen in the industry are to come over the next year and a half that have nothing to do with the pandemic whatsoever and more to do with our, our ability to target people with uh, precision um, as some of these additional changes come down the pike um, by Apple and, and Google. I'm sorry, Patrick, are you saying that we're going to reduce the ability to, to target people with precision uh, or increase? Yeah, you know, them. Apple's decision to not, you know, to, to force people to opt in, uh, for example, to allowing apps to track uh, their behavior. Um, uh, and, you know, Google's decision to ban third-party cookies on, on Chrome, I think those are pretty, will have, will have uh, more of an impact over the next year and a half in, in, in terms of what we do on a daily basis than the pandemic will. It's a really good point. Um, there was a report today that came out, I know the Wall Street Journal talked about, and I'm sure it was everywhere else, that after um, Apple's move, only 4% of their users opted in to be tracked by their apps. Um, I think a lot of us knew it would decrease, but only, you know, being reduced down by 96% is a pretty <laughs> big drop. You know, for me, I see a lot of those implications as being like, well, those are just apps, right? So maybe, you know, the apps of the past and politics really go away and it's now really just mobile optimized web browsers. Maybe there's more um, broader targeting, less reliance on first party lists. I know folks that I've spoken with at various networks and platforms have said, Politics has been ahead of this since first party, you know, which is targeting lists for, for our viewers. That hasn't been allowed on 
platforms like Google for for at least this last election cycle. So now that this is trickling down to consumer industries, they're asking what to do. And the networks are telling us on the political side, oh, you guys are actually ahead of the game since you've been forced to deal with this for the last two years. Um, you know, this, to Patrick's point, is a pretty big deal and a pretty big change. For our viewers out there, you've been able to track down to a very granular level, the individuals, you could grab a list and have it be curated, loaded up and target just those people and then put cookies on them and track them wherever they go and whatever they do. Um, that's changing. So what, uh, you know, how big a deal do you all think this is going to be? And, you know, can we adapt, but do we suffer um, through that, through that adaption process? The irony is not lost on me that Apple is doing this at the same time that they've created a tile that tracks you wherever you go. So I, I like, I feel like, you know, we're all sort of buying into whatever corporate line people say about like, oh, this is for the consumer, but no, it's because there's like market competition, right? We should be realistic about the reasons why companies do what they do on um, so that's just a mild complaint. Um, I, I think, you know, honestly, as practitioners, it may be frustrating to not have that granular targeting opportunities for some networks. But I also think that that potentially helps us grow as, um, you know, part of the broader campaign strategy. You know, the, the wizards and the great, um, you know, geniuses of the world that are TV media folks, they pick the broadest message and they say this will offend the least amount of people and move the most amount of people. And that is a big element of digital campaigning as well. And we use that targeting to get to the big kids table. Um, but now any sort of competitive persuasion or GOTB program to reach a mass amount of voters is going to need to encompass some of those broad-based messaging. Yeah, I think for those of us that have been doing it a long time, we've kind of joked like back to the good old days. <laughs> Not as their good old days, the olden days <laughs> of digital campaigning. So yeah, I think, you know, it kind of, it's some bumps in the road. Okay. We got to change our tracking and, you know, who's, you know, how are we going to do some Google search advertising and things like that, especially on, you know, shared donation platforms, which I'm sure are at blue, you know, those who are driving traffic there are dealing with it as are we um, with different things. But at the end of the day, I don't, it's a bump in the road. We'll keep going. Apple can't stop us. I do think one thing is that, and this is probably one of the things that um, is going to trigger Kari, is, um, you know, you're going to see less of the sort of traditional Facebook ads, and you're going to see more list brokering and list swaps and all of that stuff that um, digital strategists are pretty divided on. Um, and that may gunk up the works in terms of deliverability if you have a um, you know, a company that doesn't know how to do it right. Um, so that, that's one thing that I think is a, a major change that we're seeing. Yeah, I think the, uh, you're right, does trigger me. Uh, you know, I, I have for many, many years believed that every every email ought to be an opt-in email. Uh, I, I kind of think we, we kind of lost that fight. Uh, and, you know, I think in the world of politics, what we have now is, a, is a, increasingly a culture where, I'm about swaps, but certainly buying lists, uh, highly targeted lists, um, and uh, it's happening. Um, and I think, frankly, the, the audience out there has, given up hope that they're going to be left alone uh, once they've signed on to some political list somewhere, they're going to get bombarded with, with campaign uh, emails. I do think it's, a, it's tremendously important that campaigns do so when they do send emails that they, uh, one, respect the opt-out, um, you know, per the terms of service of their platforms almost certainly, but number two, do send emails that are ethical and, and are not, um, you know, where they don't lie. Uh, to people. I think, you know, you saw the New York Times article about, about some of the uh, Trump campaign's behavior. It's, it's bipartisan. Um, you know, there are lots of Nancy Pelosi emails where she promises to personally match every donation that comes in. She has the financial wherewithal to do so, and of course she's not doing that. Um, and we shouldn't lie in our email fundraising uh, uh, programs. Um, and uh, I think that's endemic everywhere. But as for the list brokering and list swapping and all that, yeah, that, those horses left the barn a long time ago. 
I do think Nancy Pelosi can do anything she puts her mind to, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she wants to personally match my donation. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll look forward to that. Uh, waiting for it. That's great. I, I do find it uh, interesting that people tend to complain a lot about um, what is trackable online and they don't even know what's being tracked about them offline. Things like magazine subscriptions, car purchases, home purchases, I mean, major life events, arguably more major than what you're browsing online are things that data companies curate, sell, and are able to be targeted. Um, and you don't hear that talked about ever. MasterCard and Visa have been in the business for 40 years. Mm -hmm. You know, part of the reason might, you know, I, anybody who's bought a car or signed a mortgage, you know, it, 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 you could make the claim that you sign somewhere in there a paper that allows these companies to sell your information. Nobody reads. They're not fine for it. We all know that. Putting that aside, I think, you talk to anybody who has Facebook, they think it's completely free. They're giving up nothing. Maybe all that's not true. It's not free. They're giving up their data to be able to, uh, Facebook then turns around and uses to sell advertising. Um, so I, you know, I think that there is a way to uh, allow people to understand sort of what they're giving up in a clear way. And, um, uh, you know, and, but, you know, to Andy's point, I, I think that these changes will have a, a, a far higher impact in the fundraising space than yeah, if people knew that why the Netflix uh, movie that they wanted to see was recommended, you know, that that is what we're doing. People just, they, they seem to ignore it when it benefits whatever they're looking for. Yep. People just don't want to see a political ad, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these being free services that everyone's electing to use, um, it's interesting that they're complaining so much about, about them. Does anybody think that there's a marketplace for a subscription-based social media platform? Pay seven to fifteen dollars a month, but none of your data is sold. I know one one comment against that is that it's not going to be a customized user experience, and the user experience will not be as good. Therefore, but does anybody I just think that that's got legs? I just don't believe that the data is not sold. I think I think the trust there would be just, I don't think anyone would believe it. I think the also thing that's different about the social media experience from television, from mail, is that TV, it's a one-way conversation, right? Mail, you look at it, you're done with it. Social and digital, you interact with it, you share it, you argue with your neighbor, you say that's a lie on the comment, um, you donate five dollars, and so if people are looking for a different kind of user experience in some of these other platforms that we're stacking them up against, and you lose some of that. I'm going to show this, you know, photo of my new house. Like if you only have an opted in user experience, who gets to see that cool thing that you did, right? So you lose some of what people go to social media platforms to use anyway. I think it limits to who joins and things like that. You know, I think to, uh, those of us who are in this world and even who just closely follow all the data stuff care a lot more about it. And I think it kind of becomes like, oh, that's crazy that they're stealing my data, but I'm still going to go back on Facebook tomorrow. <laughs> you know, so I think, and it's at this point too, this isn't 20 years ago when it was just at a few colleges, you know, everyone's already on these big networks and people want to be where their friends are. And um, I don't think that that would be a big just change in our behavior where I think it would be difficult. And again, going to the financial aspect of it, I think that that quickly eliminates a lot of people. Yeah, there have been multiple attempts to have um, privacy forward paid social networks. I, I paid three bucks, three bucks a month to one of them for two years before I suddenly realized what was happening on my credit card. And I never went to the, there because there's nobody there. Um, the, the whole thing about social networking has to have a, a a, a meaningful number of your actual real life friends there to, to justify the, the time that you spend there, much less the money. And as soon as you create a money barrier, nobody shows up. The exception to that might be some very narrow sort of like, um, uh, you know, uh, interest groups. You know, you could, you could see, well, certainly we know about their you know, private social networks for very high net worth individuals, for example, they hang out together. Um, you could see industry groups of, uh, you know, whether it's, um, you know, stock brokers or, or, or Hollywood actors, you know, hanging out in, in, in 
you know, sort of private clubs, essentially, on social networks. But in terms of a broad-based social network with, you know, uh, 50 million Americans, I don't think that's going to happen if you charge money for it. It's the same thing that we tell our clients. You can't just post and think everyone's going to see it. You have to promote it, too. <laughs> Otherwise, you're talking in a vacuum to yourself, Is it? to three friends. That is a great point. Um, so I know we've gone a little bit over, but this has been a great conversation. If there's one more question that we wanted to ask the panelists. Uh, finally, for the next election cycle, if you could change one thing with regard to platform behavior or government, government regulation, what would it be and why? I also put that in the Zoom chat for everybody. But, you know, could change one thing regard to platform behavior or government regulation. What would it be and why? I've got one. All right. I think all members of Congress should have to go to digital school and learn what we're talking about before they make I, policies on it. I was going to say something hey. similar. I would say, like, before anybody comes out with policies and regulations, whether it's on social media, text messaging, I mean, that's something we didn't even talk about. That's gonna change a lot. Uh, yeah, the requirement is they have to actually talk and learn, um, you know, talk to people who actually use the mediums and how we interact with it and how we handle it and how people take in the media versus just making arbitrary regulations that make no sense. That is what I would ask for as well. Like talk to the real people who do this stuff. I would I would roll back Facebook's entire advertising infrastructure to about five years ago, uh, and and then you know implement the you know postcard you got to prove you're an American to buy political ads thing sure fine, but the ex excessively um, you know baroque kind of system of business managers and account managers and all of the nonsense, uh, I would get rid of all of that, rip it all down uh, and make it like, you should be able to just take a piece of, take a graphic, some copy, choose your, choose who you want to target, give this, you know, put in a credit card number and let it rip. Uh, that, simplicity is key here. So Mr. Zuckerberg, if you're listening, make it easy for us to give you money. Uh, in my fantasy world, since I don't know that any of these things will actually happen, um, I will, I'm going to go, the, I'm going to pivot and say more regulation. I want to know every advertising, the spend, what people are saying. Um, you know, I, there is a lot out there on the Hulus and the DSPs of the world that we're not able to track and share with our clients. And from a purely uh, selfish standpoint, um, you know, you're able to see, okay, we're outpointed on television, we got to do more. And if people really had a better sense of what was on the internet, because I, I do not think you can just take Google and Facebook and extrapolate from there, because there's a, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why that doesn't really work. Um, you know, you can better make the argument to clients and better illustrate you know, how seriously we're being outspent. I think that's the one thing that Republicans and Patrick, I know you and the uh, priorities have um, done a, 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 a great job trying to catch up, but Republicans do, I think, really spend a lot more online in places that we can't see. And um, we're gonna need to continue to be competitive. And, and that would be one place that I think would be incredibly helpful to both sides. And not just from a tactical standpoint for practitioners, but for journalists and other uh, observers, from a democracy and a, 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 a sort of you know accountability perspective, it all ought to be transparent out there. Yeah, in a perfect world, we'd have you know like Andy said, legislators who understood how to use the internet, how um, uh, who could then uh, pass uh, sensible regulations so that all of these platforms are on the same playing field in terms of disclosure of ad spending, uh, regulations around uh, how. That the types of sort of ad spending that they they will take, uh, you know, their um, you know, different approval processes included in that great, um, you know, these are all you know, complicated issues. But uh, understanding it's not a perfect world. I think the very least that uh, Facebook as a platform could could do, uh, and Google as a platform, particularly on YouTube, is do something about their algorithm that continues to promote inflammatory false information that is harming our democracy. They're making a choice every single day to allow their algorithm. Um, and they don't need regulation to stop. Uh, they just need pressure. Uh, 
Uh, and so that to me would be uh, one great change that I think would help the country. Terrific, what All a right. great discussion. Right. Ben, great job. Thank you for moderating today, Ben Olson. Carter Kidd, Patrick McHugh, Shannon Chatlos, Annie Levine, Kari Chisholm, thank you for this is a great discussion today. Really appreciate your time and all your efforts. And uh, I hope uh, our audience has enjoyed the conversation and uh, we'll uh, continue to do uh, programs like this and uh, uh, bring new insights uh, to light. And so uh, thank you all. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Mark. Good night, everybody. Great talking, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye. Bye.